All right, and through the magic of uh, videography, we are back. Digital video, you gotta love it. I, somebody should have invented this years ago. Um, some of you know that joke. Anyway, let's get back into things. Um, uh, homelessness, uh, we were just on the break, we were uh, talking a little bit about uh, homelessness. And uh, you know, I've got all the statistics, I think I read them off last time, but uh, we're in the range of 1,400 to 1,600 uh, homeless. It, that count could vary pretty significantly. But given uh, that's about double the estimates from 2018, what that says is at the end of your term, we could be at you know the 3,000 range in terms of houseless in the in the county and the community, uh, and they're obviously moving around a, in a lot of places. Um, the when we uh, had the forum in February, I thought both you and Candidate Bailey um, had some very cogent discussions on homelessness. A lot of it really centered on China Hat Road. Mm -hmm. What I thought was interesting was in the interim. Um, very little news out of China Hat, which could mean that things were working or it could just be that um, it was being managed well. But uh, now all of a sudden there were a lot of, um, a lot of news coming out of Juniper Ridge, coming out of South Lapine, and coming out of around the Redmond Airport, mm -hmm. including a uh, fire that actually closed the airport uh, for the right. portion of the day. Um, so what's, uh, have you, Seeing where you are and now also moving into a new position, moving from candidate to, you know, the guy that's going to do this. Um, what's your, uh, has your opinion changed much? What are some of the things that you really want to do to address something like that? Well, safety is a big piece. You know, safety for not only the people that are living out there, uh, but also the people that live around there. I have had some good meetings with Forest Service. They are uh, going to implement some plans for China Hat Road here in the very near future. And we're going to support that. Uh, I did tell them that it is a priority for me to address the safety issues. There are other enforcement actions that we can take, and I think whether it be driving without licenses or insurance and the way they pull on and off the highway, or uh, but dealing with the traffic issues, the vehicle burnings, the shootings, the stabbings, the violence that's going on out there, uh, we're going to address that piece of it, but we will support the Forest Service and BLM on what actions they start taking. Uh, I don't know if their timeline has changed at all with the holidays, but I, I would imagine that soon after the first of the year, we're gonna start seeing some action from the Forest Service. And again, we're gonna support them. And I've offered uh, anything that they need resource-wise from my office, uh, they will have. Mm -hmm. um, besides that piece to it, there's the humanity piece to it. I think you know, one of the biggest pieces of law enforcement is we have to do our work with compassion, uh, but we also need to enforce the rule of law and and control what's going on out there. The, the Board of Commissioners are moving forward with their managed camp, mm -hmm. and we're gonna support that mission as well. But we need to go out there and, and start being seen and present. I think they were uh, building these camps in hopes that the police weren't gonna come out there. A lot of them built um, barriers, if you will, to prevent law enforcement from coming out there or making it difficult for law enforcement to come out there. Uh, same with medical services and, and to, Third, the third party service providers that are servicing the toilets and things out there, mm -hmm. uh, they've made it so they almost have this uh, little village or cult or community out there that uh, they weren't expecting police services. Well, we're gonna change that. We're gonna be Seattle seeing. tried that a few years back. It didn't work all that It didn't work too well for them, yeah. It's, it's a lot like that. Uh, but we're gonna get seen out there. Uh, the current administration uh, did a good job of, of being seen out there and offering from fire extinguishers and fire blankets, but, um, that was a good short fix, but now we need to figure out how to get people services that will either get them onto the next stage of life or um, out of the dirt. Right? But I think leaving people to live in the dirt is not compassionate in any way. Yeah. And if you're managing a particular area, you know, we, we use that euphemism, do you, uh, do you have concerns about what happens to the community as it disperses? I mean, does it disperse and re-aggregate somewhere else or does it just disperse and now you're covering a much larger, uh, much more uh, dehydrated problem. Well, that's typically what we're seeing now. We're seeing it disperse from one area and reform in another. Uh, but I think we all seem to agree collectively throughout the organizations is that giving people those resources to get out of the dirt, uh, whether it be finding a job or securing temporary housing or permanent housing, mental health services, drug rehab services, that's the piece of the puzzle that we, we haven't been able to really bring bring out. Uh, in, in having them, holding them to that consequence of, if you choose not to accept these services, we can't have you continue doing what you're doing out here. So you're gonna have to make a choice. 
uh, that's, I think, to the point that we're at. And I think that's what people are now expecting, mm -hmm. is people have said, hey, we've been, we've been very polite and very compassionate, but now between the fires and you're, you're threatening my house and uh, fights and gunfire and things are now in my backyard, it's, it's, it's time. I think that was one of the messages that I got in this election was enough is enough. We right. need to do something. Uh, so we're going to get a, we're going to get more aggressive with it. And how do you work with that? You know, you talk about working with the homeless community, and you said we've got to work with the community around it. What are the things you want to do with the community around it? I mean, it's a, it, I personally experienced one in South County, a, a forum that Newberry Regional Partnership had put together, and uh, there were some there were some reasonable voices there, and there were some angry voices there. Sure. How do you how do you balance what you're doing with the time it takes to do it with the patience mm -hmm. of the people around you? That's a good example because uh, currently down in the Lapine or the Darlene Way area, uh, they've made great strides with uh, dispersing those camps that are down there. Our office, uh, in particularly um, the Lapine office, the staff down there, we have a sergeant that's done an amazing job of communicating and explaining why we do what we do and how we do it, and then showing them, hey, here's the work we've put in and here's the finished product, and hey, look, we're down to a handful of camps now versus uh, uh, maybe 50, 60 of them. So I think by explaining and, and communicating, having a two-way communication with the community made a big difference because mm -hmm. now they understand. Before, uh, we didn't know where the forest service was going or how are we going to do it, and we just we didn't have that open conversation. And now in the last six months or so, we're seeing that Darlene camp really dissipate. And that's a great example of giving it that focused attention and mm -hmm. getting out there and developing those relationships because we're not going to arrest our way out of a problem. We're not going to give tickets and get that. That's not going to get us out of this problem. Right. But having that communication with not only the community, but the people that are out there and saying, hey, here's your options. Let me help you figure out which one's the best that will meet your needs so mm -hmm. we can get you out of the situation. And Darlene was a, you know, there's several fires down there and we got lucky on every one of them. Uh, so I, I, I have the same concerns with China Hat now. I think China Hat is, is very dangerous in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And the people that are in those communities have a reason to be worried, and we need to give that same attention there. So, I think we've we figured out kind of the magic sauce down in Lapine. We just need to now get up here and start applying it to the other areas as well. And I know the city of Bend and the city of Redmond, and we're all looking for answers. And there's no one answer, but I think we need to get working together and with the service providers and figure out how we can get that um, that spread out mm -hmm. and figure out. But you're right. It, you could. It's like whack a mole. You hit. You hit one of the moles and they pop up somewhere else. It's the I mean, same, same thing. It's the whack-a-mole. I totally agree. Um, now, with that, that leads into, and actually, I actually hadn't even thought about this until you were talking about it. Um, you know, obviously, at the same time, uh, Oregon's making a pretty significant change around uh, reforms around Measure 101. And, 110. Uh, 110, thank yep. you. Um, and 110 and all the work there. And the Sheriff's Office kind of has an outsized role in that in mm -hmm. terms of uh, how that fits. Does that look different in terms of working with drug reform in the cities versus working with drug reform in the, uh, in the homeless camps dispersed? Uh, you know, I don't think so. So Measure 110, uh, we're very blessed here in Deschutes County to have those, those resources. Uh, Measure 110 didn't mandate those services. It just asked if you could, would you? Right. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have the ability to do it. Uh, Deputy Marchington in our jail has done a, a great job of uh, putting that program together and standing it up, and it continues to grow. I, I always point out to folks, though, before 110, we, we had our own Measure 110 already in Deschutes County with drug court, mm -hmm. um, long before Measure 110 came out. So we already had something going, and we kind of knew how to, how to make that system work. Uh, but we stood up the Measure 110 um, program, and uh, it's, it's, it's growing. It will continue to grow. You know, the, only, the, the thing I have always struggled with it, though, is the people are not in trouble. You know, making, being homeless isn't necessarily make you in trouble, right? So you can have people that are saying, hey, I have a drug problem. Yes, I'm homeless. But do I have to get arrested to participate in this program? Uh, what's my off-ramp, mm -hmm. right? And, and so I don't want to put people into that system that don't need to be in that system. So the service providers in the area have, have, done, have recognized that too and have done a great job providing people those off-ramps that are not in trouble and that we don't want to put in the system to let them find treatment resources that will meet their needs. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's huge. And so introducing that to the homeless community or people that are struggling with addiction to say, hey, if addiction's what's keeping you from holding that job, from getting an application, let's, not, let's deal with this now before you do get arrested and you have a criminal record and we can't deal with it. 
let's get you in the rehab now. And you know, I've had some uh, supporters that for my for my campaign that surprised me. They're, they're people that I have arrested six, seven, eight times, and over the last 20 years, uh, I've got to know them, watch them come out of their addiction into um, being a, a functioning member of society. And being able to reconnect with those people, learning, and they say to me, hey, the only reason I got this job, or I'm now I have my kids back, or I'm, I got married and I have a house, is because you took the time to sh talk to me and talk to me like a human and explain to me what my options were and you, you know, you can't make an addict want do something they don't want to do, but they heard me again and again and again say the same thing of, hey, you're better than this, let me help you. And then finally, after so many years, they let me connect them to services and now they're functioning adults. That's what we need to bring into this programming, especially with homeless is, hey, you're in a situation, let us help you or let me help you, treat you like a human with respect and dignity, and let's get you out of the situation. Uh, it's really easy to box somebody in and say, well, you're homeless, you're a bad person. That's not the case. It's, right. it, there's many different types of homeless people and, and how they got there different ways. But we need to connect services, whether it be a vet who needs to reconnect with family members or a mental health issue that's preventing them from holding a job, whatever it might be, uh, is getting out there and, and making those contacts in Darlene way. Uh, Sergeant Kalmbach did a great job of doing just that. Mm -hmm. So we need to do more of that. Okay, good. And you, you touched on mental illness and some of the other things. I mean, because they're, they're interrelated, but they're, but they're not necessarily an overlap totally one way or another. You know, obviously there's a lot of good resources in the county for mental illness as well. Um, again, is that different from a rural perspective versus a, a you know, a urban perspective or? I don't think so. You know, it's the people that find themselves in the rural areas are no different than the people that are in the in the in the cities. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, they're probably a little bit more um, resilient uh, because they can do more with less. Uh, I'm always amazed. Some of us just like to check out of society. That's why. We that too. Life. That too. Uh, I'm always amazed at people that choose Central Oregon. Uh, maybe maybe it chose them. I don't know. But people that are hardy enough to be homeless in all four seasons that we mm -hmm. that we go through here. Uh, I've always been amazed in that. I I remember. Went going to visit a homeless man that lived down in the DRW area for years when I was a young deputy and He had been out there for 10 11 12 years uh, living in in his tent and going to work every day and That was just his lifestyle and I go check on him whenever the snow got knee-high and make sure he was all right And he'd be in his tent just enjoying Enjoying his evening and I just never understood how people do that, but there are people who do that and choose that lifestyle uh, but I don't think there's a difference. I, you know, I think mental illness is mental illness, but you're right. I think they're in there wherever they are for a particular reason, but I think the needs are still the same. Mm -hmm. And the sheriff's office in some of those cases has shown uh, some support for other county services, notably like the stabilization center. Mm -hmm. And again, as budget crunches come in, I, in fact, I think last year in the budget uh, that uh, ended up having to get pulled is, uh, you know, again, I'm not trying to pin you to a position one way or another, but is, something like the Stabilization Center in your long-term plans as, a, as for county law enforcement? I think so. I think it should be in everybody's plans, so though. It, it saves us a ton of money from housing people that don't need to be housed that are just in crisis that the Stabilization Center can take care of. Um, jail is not a hospital. It's not right. a mental health facility. It shouldn't be. Uh, if there's criminal behavior, then we'll deal with that piece. But sometimes somebody in crisis doesn't need to be in jail. They need to have those services. So I believe that using the Stabilization Center in the long run saves the, sa the, the jail and the taxpayers money. Mm -hmm. uh, I would go a step further and say the county's in need of a good, a good quality medically supervised detox center. People that are, again, unsafe to care for themselves, uh, where they can go and detox in a safe medical facility, something similar to the Stabilization Center. Mm -hmm. Portland had one for many years. Uh, and then it closed down prior to COVID, I believe, uh, to where law enforcement could take somebody who's unsafe to, or unable to care for themselves because they're so intoxicated or impaired. Uh, we don't have that. Uh, we unfortunately don't have that. And I think that would be something that I could see a, an investment in that would save also a lot of money uh, from housing a person in jail that, again, doesn't need to be in the system, but rather just be detox. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. If we, I mean, I'm just trying to make sure we're touching on everything. I mean, the sheriff's office is a big job. Is we're, you know, we're barely touching on a, on the surface of a bunch of things. 
you know, obviously you talked to somewhere about multi-agencies, we talked about code and certain, you know, the future cot and, and, the, and the rest. Um, and we talked a little bit about the Central Oregon Law Enforcement, you know, the, the Supervisory Committee. Um, what, what do you want to do in there? I mean, you know, it's uh, typically, at least my understanding of it, I've, ne I've never been, but, you know, there's kind of two large agencies that sit in there and then a lot of other agencies that are really trying to contribute. What, you, what role do you want to take in terms of overall Central Oregon Law Enforcement? Because you've got a big job in front of you in terms of running the Sheriff's Office to get started. You're talking about Coles? Coles, yeah. Yeah, so Coles is a great example. It's, it is. It's, it's all the agency heads uh, from Jefferson, Crook, and Deschutes County coming together, and they uh, talk about what's happening in their communities. They talk about what's happening in their agencies. Uh, they then also provide oversight to the Central Oregon Drug Enforcement. Mm -hmm. and to the CERT team or the SWAT team, the, the mm -hmm. Tri-County SWAT team. Uh, a lot of experience in that room, and I think as a new sheriff, it'll be important for me to go and make those relationships and talk and listen to what people have to offer. I think that's the first thing I need to do is remember I'm the new guy, mm -hmm. but it's also you have a room full of really experienced people that uh, I think will be great to tap for resources and information. I, I don't think I'll be seeing anything that hasn't been done before. So I think right. reaching out to another sheriff or another chief uh, and saying, hey, what would you do in a situation or what advice do you have? I think is ideal. I think that's it's a fantastic resource. I have never heard of anything like Coles until I came to Central Oregon. Uh, but think of the CEOs of major companies coming together and talk about strategies and planning and, and collaborating. That's what that is. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's a valuable tool. Uh, I will definitely participate in that program um, I have been now as the supervisor of drug yeah, enforcement because so, yeah. they were my really my bosses and I also serviced all those counties. So I had that relationship before. And I think now it'll just be a, a better relationship. Mm -hmm. So that's the start of the relationship really with the leaders because you'll have that opportunity Absolutely. to get in with them. I mean, what's the, uh, it's in, you have the, a pretty unique task. I mean, even over the other two counties around us, uh, um, Shoots County is huge. I mean, it's uh, my notes say 3,055 3, uh, 3, square miles. Right. Um, I'm sure Google told me that. Google, knows, it's Google, accurate. Google never lies. <laughs> um, and you've got a lot of other partners. I mean, sometimes you're the lead and they're the, and they're the follow. Uh, sometimes they're the mm -hmm. lead and you're the follow. I mean, it's, um, have you, you've had a piece of that as codes, I mean, but now as a new leader, what's the way that you start to experience how to develop and improve those relationships over time? Well, it's like any other relationship, right? They're, they're going to start in different places and di different uh, levels because you've worked with some people, but maybe not others. Uh, but it's relationship building and building trust and respect for each other. It's no different than uh, any other relationship, really. Again, you've got a, uh, a wealth of talent that uh, can do nothing but help you or if you need help or if they need help. It's, it's all about collaborating. You know, public safety is a team sport. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it's not one person or one agency is going to solve all the problems of the world. But when you can collaborate and work with other agencies, uh, maybe not to repeat services, maybe uh, uh, I always use the example of um, traffic enforcement. You know, if you, if you work together on a traffic mission, whether it be speeders on the parkway or speeders in 97, uh, if we all come together and bring agencies together to do that project together, uh, you'll get more done with a team than you would if I just sent two people yeah. out there. Uh, and, and being able to support each other, I think, is important. But I, again, it's the collaboration piece. You, you have to, and, it, and I just, you know, we talk about law enforcement, but same thing goes for fire. We work with Ben Fire and Lapine Fire mm -hmm. and Sisters Fire and, and getting to know those people and working with their management and figuring out what they need. You know, hey, we go to a crash together. What do you expect from the sheriff's office? Uh, do you want us to come for your crashes or what types of calls? But getting out there and talking even to ODOT. You know, when I was a young patrol deputy, I used to talk to the ODOT guys and say, hey, you guys are the masters of the highway. What, what do you want from a sheriff's deputy who comes? Uh, but building the relationships with those other agencies, non-law enforcement agencies, I think are just as key as important than mm -hmm. law enforcement. But well, and a lot of that will really come back to health because, again, one of the other things that the sheriff's office you know, does for the county is the emergency management aspect, the, the True. lead in that. And all of those agencies are, are very, very involved mm -hmm. in terms of you know, fire, ODOT, uh, all the rest are there in an emergency directing traffic or ensuring that the, that the path is clear. I mean, so those relationships, 
that you start in terms of traffic management really start to pay off when Absolutely. all of a sudden there's a level two or a level three evac mm -hmm. going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it, you know, and again, as a as a personal community member of a L two L two evac this summer, um, you know, I really give a lot of kudos to the Shoots County Emergency Management and to the county itself, the County Roads and ODOT, yeah. in terms of just all the things that they put in. And so, but you're the one that makes that call as the sheriff. Mm -hmm. You know, you're the one that says, no, that, that one's, you know, that community's going, that community's staying. It's a big responsibility. It is, but it's also who you surround yourself with. And emergency management is a great example. You know, we've got Sergeant Nathan Garraby, who's uh, amazing. amazing. Yeah. That's a good word. Uh, and he's the man I would go to for any of those things. Even before I was sheriff, I would call him and say, hey, in this scenario, as a patrol sergeant, what do you think is best here? And he's a great guy at building those relationships that I was just talking about. He, he's taken the time and the energy to build those relationships. So when that happens, he has somebody from ODOT, he has somebody from Forest Service. Uh, he's a great example of that, of that collaborating piece. And that's the spirit that I will continue to build on. Uh, but it is, it's who you surround yourself with. And he's probably the best talent out there that I know of. Well, we've talked a little bit about traffic already. I mean, it sounds like uh, you're a little more interested in traffic than the sheriff's office has been in the uh, in the recent past. And uh, I think so. It, it's a, a watch my speed on 97 South now. Um, but it, it goes back to not only that the speed piece to it, but you know, uh, impaired driving is a big piece for me. I spent yeah. most of my career as a drug recognition expert. Um, DUIs were important to me. Uh, they are probably the number one killer of people in our community. And I wholeheartedly believe in traffic enforcement and impaired driving enforcement because when 97 becomes the most deadly highway in all of Oregon, in Deschutes County, I take offense to that. And, and it's sad to think that it has to be. I mean, with modern, you know, modern ride sharing and all the rest of it, it's, it seems like a way to be able to give people incentives to be able to do that. And, you know, again, living in or around a resort community, I, you know, see, see the share of, uh, uh, you know, our police vehicles pulling over DUIs mm -hmm. and it's that's a if that's part of that traffic team I think that's a that's a really important way to make sure that there's coordination north to it south. absolutely will be excellent and then uh, in terms of technology I mean you talked about the digital forensics lab and I agree I mean that's one of the most revolutionary uh, uh, forensics labs that I've seen you know in my limited experience with law enforcement mm -hmm. that you know checking around and then there's other aspects where maybe the technology is not so hot in the area. I mean, what's your what's your thoughts on using technology and exploring new technologies in order to make the public more safe, in order to enforce more laws? Uh, I'm a believer in technology. I think uh, you know the advent of body worn cameras was a long time coming. Mm -hmm. I use that as an example, but pursuits are another good example. You know, pursuits are extremely dangerous uh, for the community, the the deputy or the officers or the trooper and then the person who's fleeing, it's, it's unsafe for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, our current administration did a, a great job looking for alternative ways of handling pursuits. Uh, I want to continue exploring that. Uh, I think there's lots of technology out there to be used. Uh, I think there's ways that we can be more efficient with our deputies' times in terms of reporting and recording. And uh, we just recently went to some digital reporting methods in the cars that, uh, for example, e-citations that save time. The longer that a deputy is standing on the side of the road, the more likely they're going to get hit or run over by somebody. Mm -hmm. So looking at that, um, you may have noticed some of the light patterns on police cars over the years have changed. Mm -hmm. I always describe them now as like a lava lamp rather than a flashing. <laughs> if you haven't seen one yet, it's kind of very slow yeah. moving. And the, the science is, is that uh, it doesn't affect the driver's eyes as much. It still puts out enough warning that, hey, there's something going on. Uh, there's also been some uh, studies in the past that have shown impaired drivers drive to the lights like a moth to light, and that causes the crashes. So now they, they're changing the light patterns, and I would have never thought of that you know, 15 years ago. I, I always thought more light was better. Uh, but also the sounds of sirens, they're now testing technology that they're changing the tones of sirens so you can hear them in your cars because cars have become so soundproof. So we're always competing with new technology and cars the way that they're being built or uh, the way people drive now. I, I see more people with earbuds in their ear driving down the road than uh, because it's hands free or they're listening to music right. and they can't hear what's going on around them. So I'm a big believer in technology. I think there's a lot to be explored there. Uh, even with our training of our deputies is having that so that they can get caught up on whatever the new technology is or what the new 
practices are in their cars or on their phones or in the office. Uh, and then you've got, of course, protective gear now that that technology is ever changing. And, right. um, you know, what's bigger and better. But again, being very fiscally responsible about it because we, the one thing about law enforcement or public safety across the board is there's always a new shiny toy to buy. Uh, so they're always out there. But finding out the one that is the most effective and that will provide not only safety for the deputy, mm -hmm. but also for the community and that it's fiscally responsible to buy. Well, and the, and the world has figured out the monetization of, of subscriptions. It's that new shiny toy is really excited until you're paying for it for the next 10 True. years. True, yeah. Well, we won't have any subscription services, hopefully. But uh, <laughs> no, I think the, there's a lot to look at. I might at. take a bet on that. But we'll <laughs> I'm hoping not. <laughs> let's, let's touch on a couple other things. I don't, I don't want to keep you for too much longer. I know you got a lot to do. Um, corrections, you talked a little bit about it. And, you know, so, so, and, you know obviously you're dipping your toe in that. You know, that is the sheriff's responsibility inside mm -hmm. the county. You're taking care of corrections, and, and that's a pop, you know, talked about the well-being of the homeless population. This is a population dedicated to you. Right. That's your care, your safety, their safety, uh, medical needs, all the rest. I mean, what's your, what's your thoughts going in on that? What do, I mean, obviously, you're gonna, you said you were going to go in with open eyes on everything. I trust you're going to keep doing that. But what's, what's your approach uh, with that and with uh, Captain Schultz? Well, uh, I'll be frank. I've, I've never worked in a correctional facility. Mm -hmm. So having the experience of Captain Schultz is going to be important. My intention is to go, honestly, spend a couple of days over there and learn, learn the job and learn what it is they do. And from the ask. outside, not from the inside, I hope. Exactly, yeah. yeah I should have been clear. I worked there on that. <laughs> uh, but to go over there and to learn the day to day and, and ask questions. Hey, what, what can I do to make your job easier? What's good and bad here? Because I, I just don't know. Uh, and I've already been contacted by probably 30 deputies that work in the jail with their ideas and, mm -hmm. and what they would love to see. And some of them are easy and some of them are not. But I need to understand more about what's over there. And they'll be the first to tell you that nobody's ever asked them uh, that question before. So I think that'll be very eye-opening, spending some time over there. You know, one of the things, uh, a quick add-on to that, one of the things that I want to impose or mandate is that the command staff of our office uh, will go outside and work at least once a quarter, get out there, drive a patrol car, answer calls for service, go into jail, work in booking, go over to the shops, mm -hmm. help them change tires, get out there and be seen and, and see what the work is that we're supervising. Because, you know, as a deputy and as a sergeant for m much of my career, you rarely saw anybody above a lieutenant come outside. Uh, and then they were the ones making decisions or policy changes or, or making purchases or denying purchases for um, equipment that would make your job easier. And I never understood how they could understand what that request was if they weren't out there seeing it. So I think by having command staff go out and work, uh, OSP has a similar program where we call it All Hands on Deck. And uh, I only know about it because the troopers that were working for me at at code mm -hmm. would have to be gone for a couple of days and go make sure the uniform fit because they had to go out on the road. And so uh, same things are going to apply. I think getting seen and being noticed and, and learning people's jobs are important. Corrections is one of those. I mean, corrections got so many programs and, and services that they offer inside the facility uh, that they've become a small hospital in a lot of ways because they have so many people coming in that are not well and learning how to triage and and figuring out what services they need. Do they, maybe they don't need to be in jail. Maybe they need to be at the hospital. Uh, and, and being recognizing people that are in crisis and saying, hey, we're not going to serve them best right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get them the services they need, and we can address that later on and, and have them come back to jail. Uh, you know, I, staffing wise, I, I don't know the future of the work center right now. The work center uh, draws a lot of power, a lot of manpower. Uh, it seems to be a good a good organization or that we have now in terms of getting people out and working. Uh, I don't know what that looks like for the future yet, but I think there's going to be there's going to be some changes. Uh, again, there's some technology pieces that I like to like to look at. I use the example of you should see all the mail that comes into inmates. We have somebody who opens up each letter, unfolds it, makes sure that it's okay to move forward, folds it back up, and that's what that person does. And as simple as it sounds, I don't want to simplify their job, but uh, it's dangerous because yeah. uh, you're asking somebody, you don't know what's in this envelope uh, to start with, uh, but is it the best use of our manpower? Uh, I'd like to make sure that that's the, uh, a service that we can't give to a third party to where they open the mail for us, automatically scan it, and then we can approve it and then forward it to the, each inmate via a tablet. They already have tablets in the jail, mm -hmm. um, but maybe 
uh, digitizing that system rather than having somebody do that, especially in house. If you know, we had we've had some packages recently that were soaked in drugs, and having somebody open that mail concerns okay. me. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So I, that's an example of the technology piece, but. Uh, I'll be the first to admit I, I have a lot to learn about corrections and I'm kind of excited to, to jump in that. Mm -hmm. Well, and I was going to go into emergency management. We actually already talked a little bit about that and, and about the skills there, but obviously there's a lot of other things going on in special services as well, uh, or at least that portion. I, well, it leads to two, two different directions, but you know, search and rescue uh, in Deschutes County is uh, very heavily utilized, yeah. especially in, the, in their region. Mm -hmm. um, anything you want to add or change in that area? or? A great organization. In fact, I just visited with them uh, at their appreciation night the other night, and they're also excited about the changes that are coming. We have a sort of background with our. I, I do. Yeah, I started at Search and Rescue. Uh, that was where my passion for our office came from. Uh, it's a huge organization. Uh, I would say that they're easily in the top two or three search and rescue teams in uh, the state, and it's also a mandated service. So I always point out to people, the sheriff's office by statute is only required to have search and rescue a jail. Um, provide service, uh, civil, service of civil papers, and provide court security. There's nothing in that statute about 911, patrol. Right. Uh, that's a, an added service that we have. But not every county can have a robust search and rescue team like we have. Uh, they have a great foundation that financially supports them, in addition to the sheriff's office. But it's primarily made up of volunteers who come from all different backgrounds. And this is why I love them so much. They're talented in business, photography, drones, hiking, biking, I mean, every outdoor activity you can think of. And they want to bring those talents to the sheriff's office and collaborate with us and teach. This is the part I love the best is when I came to search and rescue, I came from a big city. Mm -hmm. I didn't even own a nice jacket because I didn't need to in, in Southern California. I had, to, I had to come up here and buy a Patagonia and learn how to stay warm. But the people in that organization taught me how to tie a rope system, how to repel, how to ride a snowmobile, like I didn't know any of this, but they, they will welcome anybody in the organization and teach them the skills that we can then pass on to the community. And that's a perfect example of what I wanna do for the whole office is mm -hmm. have that collaborative mindset. Um, they're doing great. They are also out of, out of uh, room, I would say, uh, and they're looking for ideas. I think even ideas. trailers were kind of getting overloaded there. We're to the point where we're going to start stacking cars and, and things because there's just no more room over there. Uh, but Search and Rescue is a great example. They're bursting at the seams, and the automotive folks are bursting at the seams. Uh, again, they're, they've, they've grown tenfold since I was part of that team, uh, and I will continue to support anything that they need. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. It's, I, and I was going to take a couple different directions, but we are pretty long on time, and that's actually a pretty nice way to end. Um, I'll give you a closing opportunity. Um, you know, this is your opportunity as sheriff elect to be able to talk to a portion of the public who's very interested, obviously, by yeah. doing this video. So, what's your as as a as a public servant? What is your message to the public that you serve? You know, I, I need them. I need their support. Uh, I need their talents. Um, one of the things I want to do is develop a committee or an organization uh, within our office of people within the community. Uh, you don't have to be a somebody, uh, but if you've got a talent or a skill that you can help bring to the office, whether it be as a volunteer or sit on the committee. Uh, my goal is to have a committee in place soon after uh, I'm sworn in of citizens that I can call on and say, hey, I need help with interviews or I need help with budgetary issues or researching contractors or something of that nature uh, to come together and, and give me their thoughts. That's really what I'm looking for. Uh, this is not about one person, me. This is about not only uh, our office, but bringing the community in our office and making them part of our organization and asking for help in the form of, of whatever their talents are. Uh, one thing I always said during the campaign was I am not looking for yes men or yes people. I'm looking for just the opposite. I'm looking for somebody that can say to me, hey, that's a terrible idea. What do you think about this? Or how about this? Or how about we try both? Uh, and then giving me their honest opinion about it. That's what I'm looking for in both my command staff, my deputies, my, uh, my classified staff or my non-sworn staff but also the community and, and giving them the opportunity. I, I think the first thing I see the need for is um, people who participate in interviewing prospective employees, promotional opportunities, and then of course um, with budget issues. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, and any, any final closing thoughts on your part? No, we talked about so much. Uh, I, am, I am always available, uh, so I always encourage people to call me. 
uh, the main sheriff's office, if you have a concern or a thought or an opinion, uh, I am all about listening to them. So you won't flash your cell phone number up, I promise. Oh, I think I used it during the, the election, so if somebody doesn't have it now, it's probably easy to find. <laughs> all right. I really appreciate this. It was a generous use of your time. And, you know, yeah, again, thank congratulations you. and thanks. Thank you. And uh, to you, the public, I just want to say that we at Connect Central Oregon are a 501c3 organization. Uh, this is our Central Oregon open programming media or co op media. We're focused on supporting nonpartisan opportunities to educate and inform citizens. If there are some forums that you'd like to see with other public citizens, you can reach us at decision at connectcentraloregon.org. And you can always donate by going to connectcentraloregon.org. And there's a big donate button right on that front screen that you can use. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Thank Sheriff, Sheriff Alach, soon to be Sheriff. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at your swearing in very soon. Thank you.